So this is the beginning of the most terrifying paranormal thing that ever happened to me. I lived in a house up in the very northern tip of Idaho, right about 1992 to 3. The house is still there today, still in exactly the same shape outside. But I hope for the sake of the current owners that they remodeled and repaired the basement. The basement wasn't huge. It had a large main room, basically a wide hallway. It had two doors leading to two small bedrooms. There was an uncarpeted cement floor and a little nook under the stair opposite the two rooms that were used for storage. In the spring, during the melt, the groundwater would leak into the basement due to a faulty sump pump. Because of that, the whole place would smell of mildew and mold. I'm fairly certain I spent a small chunk of my life living with some sort of mold in my bedroom. Probably not healthy. And it could have accounted for the weird things that happened in that dingy basement. I would believe that if the events that span this tale hadn't taken me into my adult life and several states away. It all started with a puppet. A snail puppet named Snaily. When I was about six, my family gave him to me. A glorified sock puppet with a long tube neck for my arm and a shell at the back. I was very good at making it talk for me and giving it expression. I even figured out how to make him retreat into the shell when he was upset. I really enjoyed it and planned on making a life out of it. So much so that on my seventh birthday, my grandparents gave me a Muppet. He was a grey, furry fellow with a big felt mouth and a stick attached to one arm. His legs ended in velcro covered feet that could wrap around me and seem like he was sitting on my hip. I fell in love. He was an extension of me, always on my hip and always cracking jokes. I loved that little fuzzball and started looking up ventriloquism at my library. My grandfather caught wind of my interest and decided he would help me by getting me a ventriloquist dummy. It was a cheap replica of Charlie McCarthy, the famous dummy that all Hollywood dummies are based on. The doll was awesome to the seven-year-old budding ventriloquist inside me. I didn't care that he only had a cheap pull string to make him talk and that his velvet hat fell off his head every time I moved him. I loved him. When my family split, he ended up going with my father while I lived with my mom in Utah. Eventually, we bounced from place to place, splitting our time between my mother and father in different states. Thus, in the final half of the fifth grade, I moved back to Idaho, into my father's new home, and into a hellish nightmare that was that basement. When I moved back in, I got a lot of toys my father had been storing, including Charlie. By that time, I was nearly 11, and I had forgotten about my love for ventriloquism. But seeing Charlie again reignited that flame, and I was at it again. Until a couple of months later, when I got my first computer. Suddenly, learning DOS Basic and playing Wolfenstein 3D became my new obsession. I cast Charlie into my mouldy closet and moved on to more adult things. Eventually, he was put away by my father for safekeeping. From the moment I moved into that house, the basement was my greatest fear. When I found out my dad was sticking me in the dingy, unfinished basement bedroom, with no carpet and mould on the walls, I pitched a fit. Not because it was gross, but because I was terrified of that whole space. The stairs leading up to the house were open-faced. I could see into the small storage space under the stairs, and it always felt like something was back there, waiting to grab my legs. I used to bucket up the stairs at top speed, in hopes to avoid that fate. The only light in the main room was a single bulb, hanging at the end of a long wire. It wasn't designed to be like that. The wire should have been in the ceiling, and the bulb was hanging from the mount that should have been attached to the ceiling. My father mounted it twice during my stay in that house. Both times it was down and swinging within a week. There was a wood-burning stove in the middle of the main room. It needed to be fed every couple of hours during the winter to keep the house warm. Of course, as someone who's terrified of the basement, the job of feeding the fire fell on my scrawny little shoulders. So it was one day, in the middle of the winter, I was in the basement feeding the fire. Since I had moved in there, I had experienced weird things. Bumps in the night, stuff falling off a shelf while no one was near, the normal. 
However, this was the first time I had lived there that something truly terrifying happened to me. As I was struggling to open the door to the stove, I heard a deep guttural growl from below the stairs to my right. I froze, hoping it was my dog hunting mice and slowly, without looking at the stairs, loaded the fire with a couple logs. I closed the door to the stove and slowly turned to look at the stairs. When behind me, I heard a voice clear as day, I will kill you, whispered in a harsh, deep male voice. I lost my shit. I screamed and ran up the stairs. I think I only touched three steps of the 13 leading up to the main house. I ran to the back of the house. A new addition, I knew, read, 40 years old, and huddled under the blankets crying. I never wanted to go back into the basement, but eventually I had to go back to my room. From that point all, every bump, every scrape, every little sound had me on edge while I was down there. Time passed. Eventually, I put the voice into the back of my mind, convincing myself I had imagined it. I always had a rational mind, one that I used to explain away all the strange things that happened to me. Finally, as things tend to do, it was pushed into the back of my mind, and I lived with just a general fear of the basement again. Until one day, again while feeding the fire. I got a sense of dread in my chest, something I couldn't put my finger on, but it got my pulse racing. I began to nope it up the stairs, when the one thing I had always feared happened. Something grabbed my leg from under the stairs. I freaked and went lightheaded. I couldn't figure out what was happening. I couldn't decide if this was real life or a dream. I know I jumped backwards. I was nearly at the top of the stairs and I didn't land on a single step on the way down. The way my body twisted as I pulled away from something holding me had me land square on my back on solid concrete. I felt the wind rush from my lungs and then I passed out. I don't know if it was from the impact or fear. I just know I lost consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. I do know when I came to, my head hurt more than it ever had in my life. I was dizzy and not fully aware of my surroundings and I crawled up the stairs and into the main part of the house. I lay down on the couch and fell asleep. My dad got home a few hours later and woke me up. I told him what had happened. He looked me over for any serious injury before telling me it must have been a dream. I was tired and lethargic for a few days after that, but eventually I felt normal and I ended up deciding it had to be a dream. Stuff like that didn't happen in real life. My brother knew of my fears and would torment me as much as possible jumping out at me or sending me to get things from the basement just because he knew I was afraid. The worst thing he did to me though was move stuff around my room at night. My room didn't have a door, so it was easy to sneak in and move stuff around. He would put my toy chest in front of the doorway or turn my desk upside down and put my chair on it. Never anything subtle about it. I didn't want to fuel his behavior, so I never got upset about it. I just moved things back. My mom always told me he would grow tired of his pranks if he didn't think they were working. Old school, don't feed the trolls moment. Eventually it stopped. Or so I thought. One night, my brother's prankster spirit came out in full force. I woke up to a loud knock on my closet wall. I looked over and in the light of the nightlight, I could see my dummy Charlie sitting on top of my toy chest, facing me. I laughed a little nervously. Charlie had been put away in a garbage bag with all the other stuffed animals I didn't use any longer. The bag was stored in a shed in the backyard. I was proud of my brother for the effort. This had more subtlety and class than his other pranks I fell back to sleep. A while later, I was awoken to another knock and I sat up hoping to catch my brother doing something else. This time, Charlie was on the floor sitting upright facing my bed. I rolled my eyes and sighed. I respected the conviction, but I was too tired to deal with it anymore, so I fell back to sleep. One last time, I was woken up. This final time, the doll was on my chest. I flipped shit and ran into my brother's room, yelling at him to stop messing with me. The only problem was, his room was empty, and it slowly dawned on me that he hadn't been home all day. 
and was planning on spending the night at his friend Nick's house. I had been alone in the basement all night. It was quite some time later that I discovered he had never moved anything in my room. In fact, by all accounts, my brother did everything he could to not go into my room. It gave him the creeps. I felt like I was going insane. I couldn't fathom how the doll had ended up on my chest or how it got inside in the first place. I ran upstairs, crying uncontrollably. My dad's door was locked, so I climbed onto the couch and fell asleep with my face buried in fear. The next day, I woke up on the couch and it all felt like a dream. Still, I was done with the basement. I started sleeping on the pull-out couch after that. I don't remember the story I told my dad, something about the mould bugging me, but I never slept in that room again. Luck was on my side and the basement started to flood heavily the next few months. And my dad eventually moved me into the room upstairs with my sister. I thought my troubles were over, but that was just the beginning of the nightmare that spanned almost 10 years of my life. After Charlie had shown back up in the basement, I refused to sleep down there ever again. It was the first time I stood up to my father about anything. He tried to force me to stay in the basement, but I'd wait until he was asleep, then move myself to the den and sleep on the couch. He'd get up for work every day to find me sleeping on that couch. Eventually, he stopped trying to make me go into the basement. It was summer by this time, and I have fond memories of staying up all night playing NES and then riding my bike to the beach every morning to swim for hours. Despite what happened near the end of the season, I still hold that to be the best summer of my life because I felt so free. I slept in that den for the whole summer, but my dad didn't like the idea of me sleeping on the couch all the time. So eventually, he moved my bed and my toys into my sister's room. This was 93, so she would have been eight at the time, and I was just about to make that full-time rush into puberty which made that situation uncomfortable to me. However, we made do, and I just avoided the room unless I was sleeping. But I had to maintain her bedtime, so I was in bed super early, and I didn't like that. I made do by reading under the blankets and playing my Game Boy by the light of my book light. No big deal, I adapted, but I missed the freedom of the den. When my dad moved all the toys in my bed into the room, I distinctly told him to put Charlie back into the shed. I watched him throw it in the plastic bag that had all my other dolls and puppets from my younger years. He wasn't pleased that I made him do this, saying I was being dumb and I needed to grow up and stop dragging him into my games of pretend. Well, one night before school started, I was sleeping soundly on my back, something I never do anymore, when I felt a weight on my chest. It was heavy and... I don't know how to say this any other way. Pointy. Like there were odd angles to it, pressing into me. At first, I thought it was my dog, a 40 pound Springer Spaniel, but it felt wrong, too small. I know this sounds like a sleep paralysis demon, but two things pushed this outside sleep paralysis for me. One, I started flailing immediately, no paralysis involved. And two, I opened my mouth to scream when something hard and plastic shot into it and pressed into the back of my throat. I flailed around, grabbing at the thing on my chest, but it was weird, like it was covered in a cloth that had a lot to give. But it was also firm and heavy for something so small. The top of it was round plastic, and I kept trying to push it, but it wasn't moving, and I couldn't roll to my side. Eventually, in my wild attempt to get this thing off me and out of my mouth, I was barely able to breathe, and I've had a distinct fear of suffocation ever since this day. My hand latched onto a part that was hanging off the main mass, a single string at the base of the hard plastic on top. That's when I realized what this was. It was Charlie. I could feel it now. The weight of him on my chest was like someone had filled him with lead instead of fluff. It was his hand in my mouth, making me gag again as it tried to push deeper in. I think realizing what was on me helped me panic less. I felt like I needed to see him. I needed to make him real, I guess. So I fumbled around, grabbed my book light and turned it on. The second there was light in the room, the doll was just that, a doll. He slumped off my chest and the wet cotton arm that ended in a rigid plastic hand fell out of my mouth 
as if I had been sucking on it, not choking on it. I stared hard at the doll, coughing and crying and scared as hell. I had realised earlier this summer, no one in my house cared about what was happening to me, and I had nowhere to run. I simply sat in bed with the small ring of the light illuminating that damn doll, something I used to love and now despised. I don't know how long I sat there. By the time the batteries died on my light, the sun was coming up, casting a soft light in the room. By the time I left the room, my throat was extremely sore. I never fell back asleep. I know that much for sure. It's the only reason I don't think it was all a bad dream. Well, that and the other nightmarish things that happened involving that doll. That day, after my father had left for work, I took my frustrations out on that doll. I smashed his face in. I kicked him. I took him and swung him around, smacking him against my porch outside. I was working some stuff out, okay? After that, I took him back into the shed and saw that the bag he was in had a small hole in it, about the size of his head. So I wasn't going to take any chances. I put him in a toy chest I had in the shed. It was a square, with the ninja turtles painted on all sides, with a lid that locked. I shoved him in there and locked the lids, declaring victory, which worked for a while. I didn't see him again that summer. I had a different supernatural encounter with a being the internet has begun to call the Hatman, I guess. I didn't know he was basically a cryptid, but apparently he's a big deal and has a sub dedicated to him. I'll leave that one for now. This story isn't about him. The last time I saw Charlie in Idaho was after school had started. I had just come home from school and my girlfriend had come home with me. She was a cool kid. I really liked her, despite not knowing what a romantic relationship really was. But this was the last time we ever hung out. We got home and dumped our backpacks on the floor next to my front door and sat down to watch Star Trek TNG. It's part of why we were friends. She loved Star Trek and so did I. We watched it together every day after school until her mom picked her up. It should be noted that though the backpacks weren't visible to us, from where my couch was, the only way to get to the bags was to pass by us, in between us and the TV screen. Kinda hard to miss. Well, halfway through the episode, we were watching, our backpacks flew across the room. They didn't roll or slide, they passed in front of the TV, in the air, like someone had chucked them. She screamed, I screamed, there was no ice cream involved. We ran over to the bags, then we looked back at where they came from. Sitting against the door with a smug air about him was Charlie. It was like he was taunting me. The girl didn't know what was happening or why I was so much more freaked out than her. My mind was racing and I decided the only thing to do was to make sure he was gone forever. Now, an adult would think fire, but to a sixth grader, fire was not on the menu. I decided to bury him and the girl got conscripted into helping me. She was scared and confused, but eventually she did help. I got my dad's shovel and took Charlie to the woods behind my house. I dug a deep hole, super deep, to a preteen that had to have been at least three feet. I threw Charlie in and the girl said the, as I was laying down to sleep prayer while I buried him. I don't know what it's called. I never was a church kind of guy, but after I finished it, I put a set of crossed sticks on the dirt and covered the mound with pine needles. And that was it. The girl broke up with me when she left my house that day. The next summer, I moved back in with my mom and never looked back at Charlie or that house again. I never told anyone, neither did the girl as far as I know. Not that it matter. I never saw anyone who knew me from Idaho ever again. Even when I went back, I didn't run into any old friends. So I grew up, moved to California for high school, met a girl and fell in love as one does. Eventually, roughly 1998, my dad moved out to Cali to be closer to the kids he used to neglect, and brought with him all the things we had left behind, hoping we would equate nostalgia with love. I kept that Ninja Turtle box out and left the toys in it. Don't worry, it wasn't in the box. The rest of the stuff went into the attic we had, a small crawl space with very little room, and that was that. Two years passed after dad had moved away from that property, it was January of 2000. We had all just survived Y2K. Life was good. I had dropped out of school the year before 
So I was working for McDonald's and taking every shift I could. Things were kind of growing stale between me and my girlfriend. We'll call her A. A was kind of mean, honestly, but she was hot and I was fat. So I thought I'd never get anything better. So one day, after a morning shift of work, I came home and she was waiting on my porch. She knew I would be home alone and she started doing the thing that 17-year-old kids do when they can be alone together. I was also a 17-year-old kid. And though I was beginning to dislike her, I was 17 years old. We went into my house, went into my room, and I was trying to convince her to let me take a shower to get McMuffin stink off of me when she asked why my bed was so dirty. I turned around, and on my bed was a small set of sticks, crossed under a pile of pine needles. That made little sense, because there were no pine needles around my house. Also, dear readers, though you've made the connection, I'm sure, I did not. I simply commented on how weird that was, brushed them onto the floor, and did what I had come to do. It was later. After. We were sitting together talking, and she said something about not knowing I had such a cool doll. I followed her gaze, and sat on the turtle toy box with dear old Charlie. Now, I won't lie to you. I screamed. I got really dizzy, and I thought I was going to pass out. I started hyperventilating as a ton of memories all caught up to me at once. Thing is, though, this guy was fresh. He still had his jacket. I lost it years before the whole basement thing. His hat was perfect. He had his monocle and both shoes. A didn't know why I was freaking out so hard. I asked her to check inside his shoe. She said there was white paint inside with my special mark for my last name. I ran over and grabbed him. As I picked him up, I realised what the pine needles meant. I spun around and looked next to the bed where they had been swept off. There was nothing on my floor. I told A and she started to get why I was so upset. I checked the doll all over. He had the same bald spots, everything. This wasn't just another doll, this was him. A wanted to know the story, so I explained it all to her over my Weber grill. I learned plastic stinks when it burns and leaves a residue at the bottom of charcoal grills. I also learned I wasn't as crazy as I thought, because as he burned, we both swore he was screaming. A part of me wants to think it was just air escaping his head as it melted, but I don't think that's the truth. Anyway, the long-lasting repercussions of these events means I get terrified of any dolls. I can't do ventriloquism, and I can't watch the Goosebumps movies, because guess who R.L. Stein based the books of his haunted dummy off of? I swear everyone steals my life story. Also, my wife, not A, bought a Charlie McCarthy doll from Goodwill just to mess with me. It isn't the same doll. I've never seen it, and I forced her to leave it at her parents' house across the country. She also laughed at me while I was struggling to find a decent picture of him for this story. That's true love right there. Between the ages of 5 and 6, 1987 to 88, I lived in a house along the Penned Oriel River in northern Idaho. My parents were renting it, and it would be the last house we all lived together in as a family. If anyone is following along from my other stories, you're going to learn pretty quickly that I moved around a lot as a kid, never in one place for more than three years, from 1982 to 1997. I wish we had bought that house. I loved it there. The house itself wasn't creepy. It was half a trailer connected to a large wooden building. The trailer section had two bedrooms, a bathroom, and was connected to the larger building by a short, thin hallway that contained a washer and dryer. We called it the washroom. The main part of the house had a living room with attached dining room, a kitchen, and the master bedroom with a master bath. All in all, it was a great size for my family of five. My brother, sister, mother, father and me. The best part about it was we had the largest amount of waterfront property along our little neighbourhood. Everything about my life at the time was going great, because I was five, and my biggest concern in life was how I was going to get the Ghostbusters firehouse playset. The only thing that was really a problem was that I was afraid of the dark. At that time, I had no reason to be. 
The only weird thing I ever experienced was in broad daylight, and things had yet to go bump in the night for me. But my fear often had me sleeping in the beds of others. I shared a room with my brother in the trailer. My sister had her own room, also in the trailer. Sometimes I'd get scared and try to sleep in my brother's bed. He wasn't keen on that idea, so he would make me sleep at the foot of the bed, like the dogs do. I wasn't comfortable doing that regularly, so oftentimes I would choose to go to my parents' bedroom and sleep between them. But making that trip meant going through the washroom, where the dryer was. Something about that short little hallway at night sent shivers down my spine, and I hated if the dryer was left open, because it would scare me. So I always ran through that hallway holding my pillow like a shield. I never slept without my pillow, which was nothing special, except I had a pillowcase that had a cat wearing red sneakers on it. Well, one night, after a particularly bad nightmare, I decided that I needed to sleep in the same bed as someone to make the scary go away. I tried my brother, but he wouldn't wake up, and I knew I wasn't supposed to sleep in his bed without permission. So I decided it was going to be the parents' room that night. I grabbed my pillow and softly padded through the trailer, past our bathroom, and to the washroom hallway. I remember that hallway that night with perfect visual clarity. There was a fish tank in the living room with a light that cast a dim glow into the washroom. I remember clearly the pile of clothing to my right, stuff that needed to be washed, and the washer and dryer to my left. I remember the dryer door was open. I hated that it looked like a big hungry mouth, and that the light didn't shine into it from the fish tank. I steeled myself, and I charged forward hugging my pillow tightly. I rushed past the washer, and then the dryer, and just as I was excited that I had made it, something grabbed me. I could feel cold, long fingers wrap around my torso. In my mind, I've always imagined them to be long, knobbly hands with sharp fingers. I cried out and dropped my pillow, and I was tugged backwards. I remember the feeling of the opening of the dryer scraping against my arms and head, and I felt myself bend at the waist, painfully. I heard the dryer room slam shut after I was pulled into it. Then I jerked awake. I was in my bed, alone in the dark and scared to death. I was too scared to leave the bedroom again, so I just cried into my blankets and fell back to sleep. That would have been it, just a bad nightmare that I never would even think to be anything else. I wouldn't even post something like that here if it hadn't been for what happened when my mom woke me up in the morning. She brought my pillow into my room with her and said she found it in front of the dryer. It's been 23 years since then. I don't remember a whole lot about our time in that house, and I don't remember how I reacted when my mom gave me my pillow. But my mom remembers. I was talking to her about this story, and if what I remembered about the house was accurate, and I asked if I had ever told her about the dryer grabbing me. She told me about the day she found my pillow in front of the dryer. When she gave it back to me, I started crying. I told her about my dream, and I promised I'd never go to her room to sleep again. The reason she remembers that is because I never did sleep in her room again, and she found my story about what had happened to be super creepy. I can't tell you if this actually happened, or if it was a crazy dream where I sleepwalked and dropped my pillow in the washroom, and then went back to bed. But I figured it was spooky enough to share, and it is as true as I know it to be. I'm still super picky about sleeping with my pillow, and every dryer I've ever purchased has to have a light in it. Not a conscious choice because of this incident, just something I realised I look out for in a dryer that I thought was kind of funny. A cheeky situation that happened to my friends and me in the middle of summer in Denver Round about 2008. We were bored and sitting around telling stories about the random things that we've done in life. And my time working as a locator for a paranormal hunting group came up. Basically, I was the one who would look for potential haunts. And I would contact the owner of whatever property they were going to hunt. And I would arrange the whole thing permission-wise. 
The group had a lawyer and insurance that handled the waivers and such. I just got them all in touch with each other to make sure everything was above board and legal. All that the owner wasn't held liable, in one of my idiot hunters went screaming into a hole on the property in the middle of the night. Well, that interested a friend, who at the time was a skeptic of the paranormal. One of my roommates mentioned our basement was haunted, a recurring theme in my life, I know. The skeptic said we should do an investigation, which translated into there being six of us in the basement, sitting in a semicircle with some equipment asking questions. Most of the people don't matter, save Rob, my best friend, and Goldie, our skeptic friend. Goldie didn't believe in the paranormal, and was adamant that all those people are con artists. I guess that included me too, but no worries, I don't take things personally. The basement was an unfinished large room, with a metal pole in the middle. We were sitting in front of that pole, and I pulled out a couple things I still had left over, from when the paranormal hunting group broke up. The equipment that was most important to this situation was the thermometer and the recorder. When we started, I gave Goldie the thermometer, and Rob was the recorder guy. Rob had done investigations with me a couple times in the past, just the two of us, and he knew to call out shuffling, or whispered conversation to mark it on the audio. He was also my sound guy in general. Anytime I got audio evidence, he was the one that found it for me. So the call outs were to help him sort the sounds of playbacks. So we sat, and Goldie commented how warm the basement was. It was a hot day, and there was no AC venting into the basement. The thermometer said it was in the low 80s. So we sat there for a while, asking questions and goofing around in the dark. No one was taking this seriously. After some time, I realised half of my body was very cold. Goldie commented almost immediately after that, it felt freezing in the room now. She shined a light on the thermometer and it was down to 44 degrees Fahrenheit. We were staring at the red out silently while Rob suddenly yelped and jumped up, then took off up the stairs. We followed after into the warm upper level and Rob was pacing around all hyper and freaked out. This guy was a rock and here he was babbling like a scared child. Once I calmed him down, he told me what had happened. As we were looking at the temperature, he heard a whisper in his ear and felt a shocking cold sensation on his crotch. Not one to be interested in that kind of experience with the dead, he freaked out and took off. We didn't have any evidence except his recounting of that uncomfortable situation until we reviewed the audio. There, right between me commenting about how the temperature had dropped 40 degrees and Rob jumping out of his seat, a clear female voice can be heard saying, I'm so alone. Goldie freaked out since she was the only woman in the room at the time and this voice was right next to the mic while she was at least eight feet away from me. These days, Goldie is much more open to the idea of ghosts and spirits. And that's the story of the lonely ghost or the time Rob got groped by the undead. So from the beginning, I wake up in my mum's house. It's the last day of the month. It's time to move out or be thrown out. My mum did give me two weeks notice that she wanted me out on this day. However, I thought she was then just in a bad mood. However, I was wrong. That morning, she wanted me gone. It was a Saturday morning. I had just been paid from the job centre. It wasn't a lot of money, but enough in my mum's mind to get me started. After an argument, I left with a small bag of clothes and my laptop. I took my laptop in spite of my mum using it more than I did. I took a train from Barry Island to Cardiff, then to Newport City. Then another bus to a village called Ringland. I met with two of my mates. I paid them half of my money to score me half an ounce of amphetamine. As soon as I get it, I swallow one gram. It stopped me worrying about being homeless. And at 11am, I'm planning my weekend and who I'm spending it with. This was my life every other weekend. No sleep, smoking fags, drinking lager. From Saturday morning, taking drugs. To Monday morning, 
catching a train back to my mum's with all the people going to work. I wonder why they're all staring at me. I must have looked so rough. Also, a shit example to the school kids catching the same train. I dressed well, but I was becoming very skinny. And I'm very happy I couldn't see the real look of my eyes after being awake all weekend. I look back and feel embarrassed and realise why my mum had to get me out. So I've had my drug fueled weekend, I'm out of money, and reality kicks back in and I remember I'm homeless. I'm verbally abusive to my mum over the phone because she will not allow me back there. I'm on a come down. I'm paranoid and a worried mess. I wonder if my nan will let me there, I think. She lives in a town not far from Newport. I walked seven miles to her house. She lets me in. She knows why I'm there. She probably expected me. I would never swear in front of my nan. Not because she was strict, because she's the nicest, calmest woman in the world and to this day, I don't think I've ever heard her swear or say a bad word about anyone. I'm angry, I'm swearing, I'm frustrated about my mother throwing me out. I'm calling my nan's daughter a few bad words. I'm so lucky my nan didn't throw me out then. She then probably sees my real attitude and understands my mother's reason. My nan agrees to let me stay, but only until the morning. Then she will help me find some type of accommodation. She doesn't want me on the streets. I slept on a sofa. I needed it. It's now Tuesday morning. It's going to be a long day. Me and my nan catch a bus into Newport. My mum accepts an apology and decides to catch two trains to Newport to help. We search all day. We're close to giving up. I'm panicking. Then we see a sign in the window of an empty flat. It has a mobile number and the landlord's name. The downstairs flat looks empty. I think it looks perfect. My mum dials the number, the landlord answers and advises the downstairs flat is not available at this time. However, he tells us he has a shared house on Carlion Road with one room available. We were to meet him there in one hour. He can show us in and see what we think. For me, massive relief. In my head, I'm thinking I'm accepting before I've seen it. Then 30 seconds go by and we figure we don't actually know where this road is. We ask someone walking by. They tell us we're about 30 minutes walk away. We got there, but it took longer. My nan's in her 60s and has a driving license, but doesn't have a car. My mum never felt the need to pass a driving test. In South Wales, the buses were regular. Trains and buses on the doorstep almost. Plus, she could carry more bags of shopping than the average car boot. We arrive at the shared house before the landlord. My first thought is that it's massive. It's on a busy road and next to a flyover bridge that trains go over two ways. The house is actually taller than the bridge. Outside, I'm thinking of the times I used to walk under the bridge past this house every day. I would be on my way to a work placement in a charity shop half a mile away from the bridge and house. I loved it there. It was called St. David's Foundation. The job centre had me a work placement there for 13 weeks. I used to walk past this house and wonder who lived there as the drive we now stood in waiting for the landlord was always occupied by a couple of men working in cars or other days about four cars and no people. However, the drive was empty that day. No one there, no sign of anybody. We took a look through the letterbox. We could see a closed door to the right and a flight of stairs ahead. I remember seeing the stairs and wondering how old the carpet was. Maybe 1960s looking at the pattern. Just as we were getting worried, the landlord turned up on a motorbike. He pulled off his helmet and apologized. He told us he was a teacher and was stuck at the school. My mum obviously fancied this guy. Later on, she admitted she thought he was nice. She was into her hard looking men. He introduced himself. All I could think of is that I never used to get along with my teachers and probably had a shit attitude around him. I can't really remember. The landlord got his huge sets of keys out and led us to the front of the building and let us on the front door. The door was a huge, big, solid wooden door. Around the door were huge green plants that grew up the whole front of the house. Looking back at it, definitely looked creepy. We were led up three sets of stairs. At the top of the third set was a creaky door when it opened and slammed shut by a spring. Then immediately on the right and left opposite each other were rooms five and six. 
My room would be six. The door I remember looking at, like an old classroom door, light brown with a window at head height. This window had a purple bit of cloth hanging over like a curtain. You turned the key and we walked in. Surprisingly, it looks modern. It's the size of an average kitchen with laminate flooring and nothing else in it, apart from a sink and two cupboards underneath the sink. Looks perfect to me. The landlord explains this can be temporary and when one of his properties becomes available, he can let me know and I can have one. I'm just happy with what I'm seeing at the moment. He then explains he requires in advance a payment of £230, a month's payment if I want to move in today. I'm thinking great, I've just spent £120 on the weekend and no money left. I'm gutted. Just as all the hope was drained out of me, my nan got out a brown envelope full of money and gave me the £200. I can't remember her even going to the bank, I thought, or even having a discussion that I may have needed some money today, or I would have accepted a life on the streets until my next pay packet. Whatever happened, my mum and nan knew I wouldn't have had any money left on that day. The landlord welcomes me and says the house with six rooms is now occupied. He started telling me about the people who lived in each room. I can only remember him telling me about the lad the same age as me who lived opposite me in number five, and the mechanic who lived there for a long time and could probably show me a few things, as I told him I was interested in cars and previously studied mechanics myself. Before the landlord left me to it, he told me he'd come back on the last day of the month and collect £30 for electricity and water. He left, and then I realised I needed to get some things together from my mum's. I thanked my nan, probably not enough, and I took the two trains back to my mum's and grabbed my small TV, a few clothes and a couple of DVDs and CDs in a blow-up bed, whatever I was able to carry really. I said my goodbye for now. She told me she was sorry. I thanked her for helping out. I felt this would have to be the time to change my ways. I took the two trains back to Newport Station and walked half a mile to my new room. I got to the house, walked the three sets of stairs through the loud banging door, and then into my room. I still see no one. I pumped up my airbed that I blew up with a very loud electric pump. I set up my TV. It was now about 8pm. It was a long day and I took a look out the only window. I could see a small bit of the main road and the driveway outside, with now a white van reversed into it. The main view was the railway track that ran across the top of the bridge. I was looking down on that bridge in my room. Apart from the squashed fly on the window, that was all I could see. I had a couple of pounds in my wallet. I decided to go down to the shop, which was towards where I used to work in the charity shop, but not as far. On the way, I thought maybe I could call tomorrow and see if they needed any help. I got to the shop and bought two litres of white cider. I thought to myself, I'm on my own in a new place. I'm quite nervous and I'll sleep well. After this, I remember getting back to my room and drinking from the bottle as I had no cups. I did nothing else apart from that and watched TV. Then the next thing, I know I woke up in the morning around 5am on top of a blown up bed, recognising that I still had half a bottle of cider left beside me with the top unscrewed. I looked ahead of me getting used to my new surroundings and realising the cupboard doors under the sink are wide open. I'm thinking to myself, I can't even remember even opening in them. If I did, I'm sure I would have closed them, and then thinking about the one litre of white cider I drank. That was nowhere near enough to drink to make me pass out the way I did. Human nature is normal to ignore these things and put it to the back of your head and carry on. However, trying to ignore the weird dream I had that night of being strangled was slightly more difficult to forget, but I went on with my day and didn't question it again. Until 10 years on, I'm questioning this first night along with many other events that continue to go around in circles in my everyday thoughts. One year, my mother took us kids to a state park for summer vacation. She wasn't into going camping, so she rented a family cabin at the park. The cabin was picturesque, with native stone walls topped by brown plank trim and it featured a small bedroom, a kitchen, bathroom, and had two couches in the living room. One of the couches was a hide bed, the other was not. 
a wall plaque informed us that the park cabins had been built by the WPA in the 1930s. We arrived in the late afternoon and began unloading the car for our three day stay. I was to hang our clothes in the tiny closet and as soon as I opened the closet door, I got a bad case of creepy chills. Though the west facing cabin door was open and sunshine was streaming into the room, not one ray of light penetrated into the closet. It was like the light just stopped when it struck the open closet door. The wood trim along the opening gleamed in the mellow light, but the interior was pitch black. I couldn't find the rod to hang the clothes on. I didn't want to enter the closet to feel for the rod, and there didn't seem to be a closet light. Mom brought the flashlight. Hmm. The batteries must be low, but we could dimly see the clothes rack. My sister, 13, and I, 11, would sleep on the pull-out couch. My little brother at 18 months would get the other couch and mom would sleep in the little bedroom. Unpacking finished, we hurried outside to enjoy the mountain scenery while it was still light. That night, mom left the bathroom light on with the door nearly closed. This made a nice dim nightlight in a strange place, except for the closet next to the bathroom. We had all been asleep for a while when I woke up without knowing why. Something wasn't right. I hadn't been aware of hearing anything, but something wasn't right. I studied the room carefully, nothing. I panned across the room again, and that's when I saw a very tall man leaning forward over my little brother on the opposite couch. The man was wearing a tan trench coat like in the old Humphrey Bogart movies and a 1940s era brown hat. His back was to me and he appeared to be studying the sleeping child. I couldn't move. Couldn't even breathe. Little brother's eyes opened. He looked up at the man and began screaming bloody murder. The man just faded out. He didn't leave, but he was gone. Now mom's up. All the lights are on. Brother's still screaming and won't settle down. Sister sits up rubbing her eyes groggily. What's going on? Meanwhile, I'm yelling hysterically. There was a man. There was a man in here. Mom checks the exit door next to the brother's couch. It's locked. She grabs a skillet from the kitchen and checks the bathroom, the closet. Go back to the flashlight because it's dark in the closet. Nothing. Sister gets up and grabs little brother. He begins to calm down, but he's clutching her neck so hard, it hurts. A thorough rehashing of events didn't lead to any conclusions. Sister insisted that I'd had a nightmare. I countered, what about brother? Did he have one too? Mom didn't have much to say, just mostly looked thoughtful. She had never allowed us to watch ghost or monster movies for fear that it would give us nightmares. Finally, she said we should all go back to bed and talk about it in the morning. She tried to put brother back down on the couch, but he kicked and cried so much she wound up taking him to bed with her. She left the kitchen light on this time and we finally got back to sleep. Next morning at breakfast, mom explained a little about ghosts and how this might be one. She said ghosts were lost or confused souls. It couldn't actually hurt us. After our day's activities, we would pray for the ghost and it should go away. It didn't. After our prayer session, mom left the bathroom light on with the door open, just in case. I wanted to go home. Brother still couldn't stand the sight of the couch. Sister resented the fuss because her sunburn was bothering her. Brother was to sleep with us on the pullout. I thought I'd never get to sleep, but finally did. Again, suddenly, I'm wide awake. I look around and don't see anything at first. There he is. Emerging from the closed closet door and walking slowly across the kitchen. Again, I can only see him from behind. In spite of the nightlight, the closet area is still shadowed. He disappears into the little bedroom where mom is sleeping. I wanted to call out a warning, but was frozen with fear. A minute passes, then another. A crashing sound from the bedroom, my mother's voice loud and commanding. Out! Get out! Lights on, rerun of last night. Mom said she woke up to see the man standing at the foot of her bed. As her eyes travelled up from the belt of his trench coat, the figure seemed to solidify. Details became sharper. 
She looked at his face. There wasn't one. An automotive coil shock absorber emerged from the neck of the trench coat and disappeared into the fedora hat. It raises its arms like a Bela Lugosi monster or a priest giving benediction and begins falling forward onto the bed. Right before it hit the bed, it disappeared. The crashing sound came from mom knocking her water glass and the bedside lamp onto the floor when she went for the light. Mom agreed that we would cut the vacation short and leave as soon as it was daylight. Even though she doubted that the park would refund the unused day of the cabin rent. Trust her to worry about that. Sister had to fetch our clothes from the closet as I flatly refused to go near it. She had to use the flashlight. My grandparents and great-grandfather used to own and live on a farm. A bit run down by the time I was born, but I remember it well still. My great-grandfather died in an annex to the farm, where he had his own living space, etc. The farm itself was getting old a few hundred years from the original cottage it was built around, so my grandparents decided to sell it to a pretty wealthy guy, let's call him Dan, who renovated it and made it look real nice again and modern. We stayed good friends after we took ownership, so we got there often enough. Now I've had dreams of ghosts at the farm, but never experienced it myself, but I shall tell you what others there have experienced. My grandfather had had dreams of his dad, who was my great grandfather, who died in the annex. Come to visit him at night, merely to tell him that he was gone. Dream or real, he was never sure. Also, the usual familiar smells in certain rooms are nothing crazy. My grandmother had less aggressive happenings than others, such as footsteps that faded off. Only for a door to slowly swing open. The smell of tobacco smoke from the labourer that once worked for them, and the piano would play a key every now and then. The two dogs they had would go crazy in the room with the piano, but they always barked at me and my brother, so I thought they were bastards anyway. My grandmother was always interested in my dreams about the farm, as if I was a paranormal investigator or something. But anyway, various creaks and knocks are always heard, but it's an old place. One could easily shrug it off as wind or the dog moping around. One night, Dan was sitting in the lounge, watching TV with his young son. When he swears, something touched his hair quite blatantly. Dan shrugs it off as he's sceptical about such things. Later that week, lying in bed, the call of nature wakes Dan up. Also, he notices it's surprisingly cool in the room for the time of year, but then he can't get up. Something is physically forcing him down in his bed. Dan is a giant man as well. He can't even struggle. It's as if a weight is on every inch of his body. It seems nearly five minutes of oppression before he shouts, fuck off me. Does the weight subside and he can move again? Either way, he never ended up going to the bathroom until morning after that. My family never had a bad experience at the farm with regards to the supernatural. I personally found some rooms creepy and the long corridors unnaturally spooky, but at the same time, I never felt threatened. I sometimes wonder whether it's family members' ghosts, which is why it's more amiable towards us than visitors to the farm. This happened to my sisters and I back in the summer of 1994. We were in search of an apartment to rent and one of my sister's friends recommended a townhouse she was getting ready to rent. The lady who I'll call Sylvia told my sister we should come look at the place. When we got there, we made small talk and she proceeded to walk us up to the townhouse. To give you a visual of the place, this was your typical townhouse rentals with other identical townhouses next door to each other and with a courtyard full of plants and flowers. This place also had a communal pool, if that's a thing. Anyway, the place was nice enough, clean and quiet. We walked up to the place and Sylvia told us, okay, well, the place will need a fresh paint job, new carpets, but it will be ready by next week. 
I left my sisters talking there with this lady and I decided to take a look through the window. The place was disgusting. It gave me the creeps. There were holes in the walls. The carpet had a huge black hole in the middle of it and it looked like someone had started a fire there. It made me think someone had done some witchcraft there. My first thought was why did this lady ask us to come look at it when it hadn't even been cleaned yet? It irritated me. My sisters were friendly with this woman who was a friend of one of my sisters, so maybe that's why. Anyway, it's not that important. A week goes by and we go look at the place and it's perfectly clean. We start moving in that week. This place had the living room and kitchen on the bottom floor and the first two bedrooms were upstairs. The first thing you see when you walk in the place is the living room and the stairs. My two sisters and I were to share the bigger room and my sister and her husband would take the smaller one. We planned on buying another bed in the next week or so, so we decided to take turns sleeping on the floor. With days going by and acclimating to the townhouse, there was something about it that unsettled me. I could never point point it, but I was scared of the place and didn't know why. At night, we'd hear people walking up and down the stairs and we'd tell ourselves, oh, it's just noisy neighbors. Then the baby crying every night with the other ordeal we had to work around. Our bedroom, the one me and my sister shared, also shared a wall with the next door neighbors. We could hear at night when the parents would come in and try to comfort their child. The baby would stop fussing and we'd eventually all fall asleep. The crying baby was mostly what bothered me the most. It bothered me because it was a nightly ordeal. It was so bad that I considered speaking to the neighbors about it or calling CPS on them. It really made me fed up. I was concerned for the child. Finally, one night we were getting ready for bed. My sister and I were sharing the bed and my other sister was on the floor. We could hear the baby crying and it made me sad to think this poor child was suffering and I couldn't do anything. Then I asked my sister next to me to say a prayer out loud and I asked to please include the baby next door. My sister started to pray. Jehovah God that you're in heaven, thank you for what you've given us today. Thank you for providing us the things we need. Please, we ask you to protect the child next door. My sister goes quiet. My other sister jumps in bed with us. At that very moment, all three of us are feeling the exact same thing. An enormous entity has entered our room. It came from the child's room. It feels like it's filled the entire bedroom. We're laying in bed terrified. I tell my sister to continue praying. Keep praying, Kate, she continues. Jehovah God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, remove whatever is in this room with us. Please protect us and the child next door from any evil and harm. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We stayed silent for what felt like 10 long minutes, but I'm sure it was only a few seconds. I asked my sister, did you feel it too? One of my sisters says, yes, it was huge. She says, I'm just glad we have Jehovah to protect us. We slept soundly that night, as well as the baby next door. We prayed out loud every night since, and nothing ever bothered us or the child again. I want to start off by saying that I'm a student in the UK, learning to be a radiographer, and I do my placements at a massive major trauma center. As you can guess, we deal with a lot of major trauma events where people come in, but don't leave alive. Funnily enough, being in that environment turns a lot of people into philosophical types. On this particular day, we had to imagine a major trauma victim who'd been flung from their car windshield at 100 miles an hour after colliding head on with a lorry. They were taken to the imaging department I was in for emergency imaging. Later we found out they died in resource while they were trying to get better before they were taken down to the morgue. At this stage, I want to mention that the layout of the hospital means that the x-ray department was built straight above the morgue due to the practicalities of the forensic radiography service we provide. So the place where we store the dead is really close by. So later on, me and another student are cleaning the imaging room 
after the department's outpatients closes. I want to add that I'm certain. Belief. And us English, well, we're in English. We have an affinity for this sort of thing. What with all our plagues and history and we tend to, you know, start conversations about death and ghosts. We start talking about the chap that came in earlier. I remember I talked to him while they lifted him onto the scanners because though he was drugged up and high on so many painkillers, you don't know what's going on. Maybe he could hear me. You never know, but you don't want to leave them in the dark. We said to each other, well, we hope the death wasn't so traumatic that the soul isn't stuck here and that it finds a way home and that they didn't suffer too long with their injuries and that they were at peace. Right after we said that, the x-ray machine began moving on its own. This is one of those newfangled machines that arranges itself for whatever images you want to take. You press a single button to get it to get into place. The machine was on standby and you had to click on the patient and wait projection you wanted. The machine won't move until you've selected a patient and their projection, because obviously that's the point in getting its position if you don't know what patient you have. We heard no footsteps, which you would because it's a laminated floor, and we hear hard patent canvas shoes. And you would have heard the door open because giant lead lined rectangles on hinges. None of us were near the machine buttons, which were behind a screen. I should mention that I know it wasn't a technical fault because the machine had been serviced a couple of days prior and they would have picked up the fault and put it out of service because of radiation safety issue. It moved itself into the position for a chest x-ray, which was one of the positions we took for this patient, both for the CT and the mobile that we had in the resus bed for tubes and things. Maybe that's connected, maybe it isn't. But after we saw a shadow out of the corner of our eyes, both our heads went to the same corner of the room and we saw this flicker of black go out through the closed double door. We stood there speechless for a couple of minutes, trying to get our heads around what happened. We're still trying to understand what happened to this day. It's a weird thing to happen, even so that those things happened right as we said it and how things panned out. That machine has never moved on its own since that day. I personally believe that our body is a biological machine and that the energy formed from forming neurons and memories, which are networks of energy anyway, are just conscious energies which exist after the body dies. I think maybe he followed someone back and found us and he wanted to let us know he was okay before he departed to wherever he was heading to. I hope he found where he was meant to go in the end.